Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing day. We're going to be kicking this video off with news of Intel and their XE line of graphics cards. As many of you are aware, Intel will be entering the discrete GPU arena next year with XE. Now, this will be on a 10nm processor, and Intel have been scarce on officially confirming the details. What we do know is that the architecture for XC is a significant departure from even Gen 12, and allegedly will have drastic performance increases because of this. We also know, thanks to some driver leaks, that we will see variants up to 512 execution units, but it's very difficult to get an exact performance measurement from this, because A, we don't have the clock frequency information, which is obviously imperative for us to know to judge performance, and secondly, we don't know the actual full feature set of the GPU and how it differs from Generation 12 architecturally. Nevertheless, though, we can at the very least say that the 512 execution unit uh, XE GPU, geez, that's a mouthful to say, is going to at least be in the mid-range of what we can expect from a GPU in 2020 when this launches. But what we do also know is Intel are not going to be just focused on gaming GPUs. They want to go ahead and put those GPUs in things such as high-performance computing, cloud, deep learning, so on and so on and so on. Which means that they will have differing architectures for those different scenarios, and also, allegedly anyway, have quite a robust GPU roadmap. Enter videocards.com which have come up with a series of leaks concerning Ponte Vico. Now, Ponte Vico is actually a stone bridge which is located in Florence, Italy. And this bridge is not without any real reference because this uh, bridge is kind of like Intel nodding towards the interconnect between the GPUs, which is possible with XC. Uh, the actual connection type is called CXL, or Compute Express Link, if you prefer. Now, to clarify here, Ponte Vehicle is not a gaming GPU, at least according to the information that videocards.com have received. Indeed, Intel will be sharing many more details of this on the 17th of November, thanks to Project Aurora. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's an exascale computer which Intel are involved with, and it will feature, among other things, Sapphire Rapids Xeon CPUs, Ponte Vehicle GPUs, which of course is what we're really referring to in this video, and also One API, which is a unified programming model allowing developers to more easily uh, create code for CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, or whatever else that uh, a system uh, is integrating. It's actually quite a cool concept, and in theory anyway, should simplify development on high-performance computers. So that's definitely going to be kind of nice, but we've also seen one API with other usage scenarios as well, like we've seen it being integrated in World of Tanks, and of course that's brought CPU ray tracing to the game. Of course, not as advanced as what you could do with, say, Turing and ray tracing, or presumably the next generation of RDNA GPUs, but still, it's kind of cool that it's there. Project Aurora will feature two Intel XE scalable processors, Sapphire Rapids, and six Intel XE Ponte Vico GPUs, and of course, all be tied together on one API, and obviously this will be kind of part of a larger node. It's also been confirmed that Foveros packing technology will be present, which was largely known, but it's nice to see it's confirmed. And furthermore, in this slide, we also are apparently seeing ultra-high cache, whatever that means, and high memory bandwidth, which is very ambiguous, because high bandwidth memory could mean pretty much anything. Intel have also confirmed that there will be high double-precision FP throughput. Once again, that doesn't really give us figures, but it is telling us that Intel will be shooting for the stars with Ponte Vico. Now, of course, this is going to be based on the 7NM process from the company, which means that these GPUs are not going to debut until at least 2021. It's going to be fascinating to me what the difference architecturally is 
between XE, I'm going to call them Gen 1 and Gen 2. So Gen 1 will launch in 2020, Gen 2 will launch the year after that. It's going to be really interesting to see what we have. There was a series of posts which were now deleted by Ashraf, who used to work at The Motley Fool, but now, of course, he's part of Intel's uh, team. And he actually did leak a whole series of of uh, rumours and insights into what Intel were planning with the XD line of cards. I believe this was late last year, but I can't. I don't remember exactly when the tweets were dated. It's very difficult to dig them out now, but you can do some googling. And I also covered them during my XD deep dive uh, earlier this year, so you can go ahead and check that out if you would like. Allegedly, the plans for the uh, GPUs uh, Intel changed significantly when Raja Kodori got involved and became head of Intel's graphics group. And now we will see the GPUs, uh, in the future anyway, become more of a chiplet design for the high-performance ones. I've heard, though, that the reason that the GPUs in 2020 are going to be focused on the mid-range is because the 10nm process and the high, and the packaging technology for the higher uh, end SKUs is just not going to be ready at that point, although obviously that's not confirmed by any stretch of the imagination. It's just something that someone told me that they'd heard. But it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when Intel do get involved in graphics. I must admit, I'm actually kind of cheering for Intel to get involved in graphics, Recently, uh, I reviewed the RX 5700, uh, AMD sent that over, and I really liked the GPU. And in the review, I basically said that I love the fact that we have AMD to now bring, well, competition to the marketplace, because that only works out fantastically for us. Whenever there's competition, we as consumers end up benefiting. So I'm very interested to see what Intel can do, even if they can't revolutionize the performance at the very least, we can hopefully see some value for in the market and maybe some additional movement in, let's say, graphics APIs and so on and so forth. And next up, we're going to discuss NVIDIA. As a whole, a bunch of rumors has popped up for Ampere. Allegedly, technical information on what the performance targets will be for these GPUs and also some specifications of Ampere. This primarily focuses on HPC, high-performance computing, but there is some stuff for the gaming chips as well. This information has come from kopati 7 Kimi on Twitter, although these tweets have now been nuked from the internet, although uh, website 3 d Center. Uh, .org has actually captured those tweets and actually one of the admins for the site wrote to me to let me know that these tweets did exist. So if you're unfamiliar with Kopati, he's not as well known as, let's say, Tim Apisak as a leaker, but he did reveal lots of information concerning NVIDIA's supercards. Now, personally, I did leak that NVIDIA were planning to launch uh, a Turing refresh, and I leaked that it would have faster memory. However, I did not have as many details as what Capiti had, including the super branding. So, credit to him, he certainly does have some good sources at NVIDIA. Either way, truckload of salt, you know, we don't know this information is accurate, and so on and so on. But, let's get into this. So, NVIDIA's Ampere will be split into two product lines. We will have a HPC variant and a gaming variant. That's not new. NVIDIA have done this in the past, so I kind of expect them to do it this time. I don't know the full differences, though, between the HPC version of Ampere and the gaming version of Ampere. And also, some of this information does fly in the face of what we've heard uh, in the past. Anyway... These chips will also be using different manufacturers, so TSMC and their 7NM Plus process using EUV will be manufacturing the HPC version of the GPUs. Meanwhile, Samsung will be manufacturing the gaming chips. This is not actually out of the realms of possibility. NVIDIA themselves, I believe, confirmed that they will be tasking both TSMC and Samsung to produce chips. This means, of course, that we are lo likely looking at completely different tape outs because, well, if you're uh, creating chips for TSMC, the fab is going to be different at Samsung. So that does make sense to me. 
But obviously at the time NVIDIA didn't reveal any more information than that. Anyway, getting into the specifications themselves, uh, reliable info is GA100 will feature 6144-bit HBM2 interface with double the number of tensor cores per SM. We'll get more into that in a moment. The GA101 chip is half of the GA100, so features 3072-bit HBM2 interface, but apparently this chip's been cancelled for whatever reason. Not reliable info GA100 with 8 GPC, each with 8 TPC, meaning 8192 CUDA cores, which is, well, a lot. Also, unreliable info is the fact that it's using TSMC 7NM with EUV. Switching to the gaming side of things, and just to clarify here, it's unlikely that we're going to see a 6144-bit HBM2 interface for the gaming cards. But, allegedly, there will be five variants of this. Now, what is speculation is the fact that it will be using PCI Express 4.0. I don't see it using 3.0, honestly. Because at this point, it's going to launch most likely at some point in 2020. PCIe 3 would not make much sense to launch a card then. So, I'm totally on board with that. I don't think anyone expected that to stay at PCIe Express 3. The launch is sometime in 2020. But they don't have a window. Uh, folks at different outlets have said that it's going to be the first half of 2020. But this rumor, anyway, doesn't have a pinpoint uh, release date. So, what do I think of all of this? I can certainly see some of it being true, um, particularly if the other Ampere rumors concerning the ray tracing performance being a priority are accurate. The problem is that there is a lot of conflicting data concerning Ampere. Some people are saying that it's definitely, unequivocally, does not exist for gaming at all. There are a separate architecture, I've been told this. But then I've also been told that Ampere Gaming and Ampere HPC are just diverging paths like they did with, let's say, Pascal. This is one of those things where NVIDIA are really good at keeping a lid on things. Like, I don't know if they have been trained, the people who work at NVIDIA, to withstand interrogation. But um, I, I think they must go into like secret service. I think they, I think they must train people like they were in the secret service or something to it, to uh, withstand advanced interrogation techniques. Because the folks at Nvidia are really good at keeping secrets. Either way, I, I do agree though that increasing the ray tracing performance is just a given for the next generation, whether it's Turing, Turing 2.0, whether it is Ampere or whatever else. It's Definitely, they will increase the ray tracing performance because it was easily one of the biggest uh, gripes people had with Turing. If you are playing a game like, let's say, Control, with all of the bells and whistles enabled, with ray tracing enabled, you are not going to be playing that at 60 FPS with ray tracing enabled. It just is not going to happen. The game is incredibly demanding. Which means that. If you have an RTX 2080 Ti and ray tracing is the reason you're buying the card, you've got a couple of choices. One, just enable ray tracing when you're not playing seriously. Two, play at a lower resolution, like 1440p. Or three, use DLSS on a 4K display. Assuming, or you could of course put up with the lower frame rate. Now personally, and I do realise that I'm not in the majority here, or at least, you know, it's definitely down to taste... I would rather have DLSS enabled, uh, play at 4K, and have ray tracing on. But I do know that a lot of people feel very differently to that. And they say, well, you know, I don't like the soft edges and all that stuff. But I wear glasses and at a slight distance, I don't notice the soft edges as much, particularly when I'm in action, if I'm totally honest. But I do notice it. It just doesn't bother me, maybe, as much as it does some people. But I do realise that some people don't feel like that and they really want every single uh, last frame per second and that's a totally valid reasoning. So the changes here, we are seeing an increase in the number of um, tensor cores per SM. So if we look at the older architecture, uh, well, Turing as if it's older, it's still current, there are 60 
Sorry, there are 72 SMs in the full TU-102 config. Um, so this means 4,608 CUDA cores, but in terms of tensor cores, there are 576. So this basically means that each SM has 64 CUDA cores, 8 tensor cores, and a single ray tracing cores. So apparently the number of tensor cores has been increased per SM, which presumably means that we could potentially see an increase in the number of ray tracing cores as well, which would make sense. I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of the ways that NVIDIA change the gaming version of Ampere versus the, Pro, uh, the HPC version. Maybe we will see fewer tensor cores for the gaming version, but an increase in the number of ray tracing cores or something like that. That would make sense to me. Unfortunately, what we don't have is anything solid regarding the memory configuration of the gaming cards, what the memory targets would be. There were leaks recently which said it would be up to 16 gigabytes of memory, but A, whether that's accurate, and B, we still don't know things like the uh, clock frequency of the memory and so on and so on. So there certainly is still a lot of stuff up in the air. It's going to be fascinating to see, though, what NVIDIA do with the gaming side of things and what criticisms they take on board based upon what they faced with Turing. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. But with that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll link my Radeon RX 5700 review which I put up yesterday so if you guys can go ahead and check that out it would be highly appreciated. There will be lots of other content coming up on the channel very soon including an all AMD build plus some other bits and pieces so definitely make sure that you do subscribe. You can also of course find us on social media so definitely follow us if you are not already and you can also find us on Patreon as well as Amazon affiliate links so if you do want to buy yourself some turnips i have no idea why turnips came to mind but whatever if you want to buy some turnips then you can do so via amazon and it will give us a few pennies and of course it doesn't cost you anything but with that said have an amazing day bye for now